No matter what class you go to, EMT, advanced EMT, paramedic, whether you're getting ready for NREMT, medical legal is going to be on there. Let's start with some buzzwords here. First is scope of practice. So with scope of practice, what that means, that's the boundary that you do not cross inside your care. So for example, that could be a state law, for example, that EMTs don't do this in our state, right? Scope of practice, for example, the boundary of your care. Protocols. So protocols is gonna be a written a document, it could be the digital, of course, but basically the guide to what you can and cannot do. And very precise and detailed, big key, precise and detailed information on what you can do when treating patients at each provider level. Standing orders, that's what you can do. So what you can actually do in your care is what you can do on standing order, meaning without calling medical control, without calling the MD in the ER, what you can do yourself out on your own, right? Think about dosing, stuff like that. Standard of care. The standard of care has to do with your actions. So in a given or certain scenario, how would another EMT or paramedic act in that scenario? And it could be at a local level, it could be at a state level, but in your service, what is the standard of care? What would a normal EMT and paramedic do in a certain situation? And if there is a crazy circumstance where you deviate from the standard of care, good documentation is needed. All right, so biggest pearl out of all this, follow your protocols, know your protocols, no cold, have them on you, okay? Especially when you're new and good documentation. Come on, we got more. So now we have negligence and under negligence, we have basically three main subtypes, but I wanna talk about a primary one here as well called the gross negligence. So negligence, I'm gonna read this to you here, is failure to provide the same care that a person with similar training would provide in a similar situation or event, or the same situation or event. Gross negligence, like it sounds, is a complete and total disregard for the standard of care. Defining here, reckless, willful, disregard for duty and care of the patient, standard of care. That's gross negligence. Now, underneath negligence itself, there are three subtypes. We're gonna flip the border and we're gonna talk about that. Now, the first subtype we have is malfeasance. What this is, is you permitting an action outside of your scope of practice, meaning it's not in your protocols. It's not in your standing order. You are not authorized to do this. You've gone too far with an intervention, right? That's an example. So being outside of scope, that's malfeasance. It's probably gonna be a test question. Now, misfeasance, that is you performing, it's in your protocols, it's in your standing order, you're performing that action, but you did it in the wrong manner. That's like, you can give epinephrine, but you gave the wrong dose, right? So that's misfeasance. So think, you made miss, you made a mistake. Right? I tell you, remember that. Again, probably gonna be a test question. Don't forget it. Non-feasance. Non. It's in the word. You didn't act. So you failed to act when you were expected to. For example, let's say under your protocols, we all know cardiac arrest, you give CPR. You didn't give CPR. Non-feasance. And those are three step types. But let's keep moving on. Come on. Abandonment is crucial to talk about for EMS. First, I'll give you some scenarios. Let's say you are bringing your patient into the emergency department and you do not transfer care to a nurse or a doctor or PA, nurse practitioner, what have you, right? Inside hospital. You have not completed your job inside of EMS because you need to transfer care to someone who is equal or a higher level of training than you are at. That is EMS to hospital. So for example, if you leave somebody in triage all by themselves and you have not transferred care and gotten a signature for that patient to someone of equal or a higher level of training than you, 
that could be seen as abandonment if something goes wrong with the patient. This is why I always say to get your signatures, folks. Now we've talked about that. Let's get into some, some other tips here. Abandonment. The type of negligence where EMS discontinues care without the patient consent. Again, this is why we transfer care. Another thing I want you to think about, right? Let's say you are the first paramedic on scene and you're, and you're a first responder paramedic. You're transferring care to a ambulance paramedic is going to do the transport, right? Make sure it's in your documentation. Who you transfer care to. Make sure that's all in your documentation. Remember guys, document, document, document. So you're off duty, you're walking around and you pull up to an emergency scene. You're an EMT, so you go and help out. You help out that patient, but you're off duty. The patient has a bad outcome. The family wants to sue you as the first person to make contact, saying that you made an error. Are you protected? Well, here's what we have. So Good Samaritan laws. This is a type of law which basically protects somebody like you or anybody out in there who's a civilian in that certain situation of helping somebody in an emergency, right? But they are different from state to state. So let's say you're on vacation in a state, it could be different, right? So just because you're an EMT doesn't mean you're all, always protected, but there's another word called immunity. There's something called immunity laws, which actually give first responders immunity in these situations. Now it's a state by state thing, but I just want to bring this up. See if you see these words, you understand what they mean, what they're talking about. 911 is called, an ambulance is dispatched, and you are part of that crew. How do you get consent to actually provide patient care. Well, if someone else calls 911, all right? So here we have, with competency, how competent is the patient? First, let's talk about patients that are alert and of sound mind. The word competent means you're of adult ears, you are of sound mind. That's what we're talking about here. Now, when we first walk up to that patient who's called 911, they say, I need help. That's it from you. Express consent. In Informed, informed consent means that you have explained what you think is going on with the patient. You've explained the situation, the circumstances, what could be a, a best case scenario and a, a worst case scenario, and what you're doing to help the patient. Then they can make that informed consent in order to decide, well, yep, I do want to get treated from you and I do want to go to hospital like right now, right? So think about express consent. Yes, I need help. Informed consent, they might say, yes, I understand the situation and want help, right? Now, what if this happens all the time? You go to a patient, they're a fall victim or drugs and alcohol or psychiatric emergency, could be altered mental status, they're unresponsive, cardiac arrest, overdose. What do we do? They can't sign their run form. A patient who's adult uh, in a, uh, years, in sound mind, they are sign their run form for transport. But what if you're altered mental status? You can't, you're not, you can't sign your run form. You're not of adult, uh, adult years in sound mind. You're not of sound mind. Implied consent, implied consent. Implied consent means this patient right now is having a really bad illness or injury that is causing them to be unresponsive or altered mental status confused at this time. Any normal person in this scenario right now would want care from EMS. So we're gonna provide care to that patient to help them, right? That's implied consent. So this is something you're gonna see a lot on test day. You get called to a 911 call for an eight-year-old child out on the sidewalk. This patient is not of adult years, it's an eight-year-old child, but they have an injury. The parents are not available. We just learned that you have to be of adult years and sound mind to sign a run form and make a decision about your health care. So here's what happens with minors. If the parents are available and they want transport, transport. If you can't get to the parents, you always provide care and transport. That is how it is, I'm assuming, in every single area, right? That's, that's, that's minor care. Now, as far as refusal of care, any adult patient that is of sound mind can refuse care, no matter how bad their injury or illness is. 
doesn't matter. If they have a dollar sound mind and they want to refuse, they can. But it is our job. We have to inform them of all the risks, let them know what we believe is going on with them at this time, and let them know the worst case scenario of them not going to hospital. We have to um, be, give them that informed opportunity to make a decision, right? But they can and they do have the right to refuse. This gets, and I can see that, you could say a sticky area. It kind of talks about restraints and a little bit where a patient is confused or they are not of sound mind and they really don't want to go to hospital, right? This can happen a lot with drugs and alcohol. And there were many times around my career where I called medical control and said, hey, look, here's a situation, but this patient can't really sign a refusal. Like, what do you want to do? What should we do here? And then, you know, I'm basically saying, hey, medical doctor and hospital, what do you think? You sign off on this, what we're going to do here, right? So that can help too. Medical control, it's not written down here, is essentially you calling into the uh, local emergency department saying, hey, I need help in this case. Now, restraints. Why, why, first off, why would we ever restrain a patient? It is for their own safety, so they do not harm themselves. For example, the patient could be under the influence of a drug that is causing them to harm themselves, where if they weren't on that drug, they wouldn't of harm themselves, right? So this is what we're looking at, a chemical restraint and physical restraint. A physical restraint is like essentially tying someone's hands and legs in order, in order for them to not hurt themselves, right? Or hurt others, right? A chemical restraint would be like a, uh, a sedative, for example, like an Ativan or Versed or Haldol. There are some sedatives for you in, in EMS, right? With restraints, you have to make sure you are following your what? Your protocols and what's your standing order of operations for physical and chemical restraints, right? Make sure you're following that protocol to a T when it comes to these cases. I'm gonna be sharing with you how to recognize obvious signs of death in a patient. First, I wanna talk about these terms like DNR. So DNR means a do not resuscitate order. And these orders can be slightly different depending on where you are. But basically, essentially what that means is if the patient becomes incompatible with life and they go into cardiac arrest and they are deceased, then there should be no life-saving efforts via EMS, via the hospital for the patient. Now, advanced directive what that means, and I'll read it to you here, what should be done if the patient is unable to make decisions. So in a, usually it is a written document that is done by the patient when they are actually competent, when they are alive. Some call it a living will. And this advanced directive essentially tells everyone, family, healthcare providers, what the patient would want done if they're you know, unresponsive, unable to make decisions. A power of attorney, instead of a document, I, you think about it, it's a named person in charge if the patient is unable to make decisions due to their condition. Now, let me share with you exactly some obvious signs of death because as a paramedic, EMT, you will come across patients who may have been deceased for hours, days, even longer sometimes, and you need to know how to recognize the obvious signs of death. We call it a DOA, or dead on arrival. Now, a common call inside of EMS, you may have called to a cardiac arrest, and I want to show you the more down here, the more definitive signs to look for, and then this would be kind of the first signs of a deceased patient that you may see. Like I was saying, you may get called to a 911 call, cardiac arrest, you get there, it's either a DNR or some sort of directive and there's no care being taken place, or you find all these signs and symptoms where 
they've been deceased for hours, for days, and EMS care is not going to be effective or necessary in this case. The patient has deceased. So let's look at these first signs. Well, the first signs are going to be the patient being unresponsive, the pupils not being reactive, no breathing, no chest rise and fall, no blood pressure in the patient, and no carotid pulse or heartbeat in the patient. Another thing we look at with the life pack would be an asystole flat line on the monitor, all right? So that's gonna be our first signs. Now, our real definitive signs are that this patient has been deceased for a much longer time is going to be, first, let's talk about rigor mortis. These are two buzzwords, then we'll talk about these little extras. Rigor mortis. Rigor mortis, what that is, is the body's muscles becoming very stiff. So it's stiff muscles, that's rigor mortis. Now, dependent lividity, what it is, obviously when we are alive, blood's pumping through our whole body, right? Well, if the heart stops beating, what's gonna happen to the blood? Depending on how the patient is positioned, blood is gonna pull to the most lowest points in the patient, right? That low point in the patient. So it's blood pooling to a low point in the body. And now two other signs of a definitive case of being deceased is the tissues actually of the, the patient uh, actually being decomped. So meaning decomposition of the patient's tissues, okay? And then finally would be a severe, severe injury like decapitation of the neck or decapitation of the waist. The first link in the description down below is what I give to all my students who are getting ready for school, they need help in school right now, or they're getting ready for their national registry exams at any level from EMR, EMT, advanced EMT, and the paramedic level. First link in the description gives you a lifetime access to videos, quizzes, and, and our community group to ask questions while you are studying. I want you to check out this video right here on the screen right now, and I will see you next time.